All right. Well, welcome everyone and good afternoon to our session. Thank you for joining. This section is on expanding the direct care work workforce. Uh, my name is Claude Schminke, but I'm now going to turn it over uh, to Kathy Rowe from the New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well, who will talk us through this topic. Kathy? Hi, thank you. And thank you everybody for joining us. It sounds like you had a really long day, but a good day so far. So um, I am going to talk about um, a coalition called the Essential Jobs Essential Care New Jersey Coalition. And this came about a little more than two years ago um, when we were approached by PHI National um, with funding from the Henry and Maryland Health Foundation to try to bring this effort to New Jersey. Um, we know, and I'm sure you all know, and it is, sorry, I'm trying to forward my slides while sharing. Which doesn't seem to be working. Um, let me try that again. So as you know, there's a shortage all around in the workforce. Um, we have seen this on every level. You've seen this in every setting. Um, and it's gotten, it got worse under COVID. Um, there were problems with the workforce and the shortage before COVID, but COVID really made it worse. So when we talk about New Jersey's direct care workers, who are we talking about? I'm sorry, Claude, if you have suggestions for what's going on with my- um, I, I do see it being shared, Kathy. Yeah. Uh, so, so do you see my screen now? Yeah, I did see, I, I saw it previously. Uh, there yeah. we go, I can see it, I can see it. Okay, but I can't seem to forward it while sharing, so. This is, your just... this is your producer. There are um, little bitty buttons at the bottom of the screen that have like a back arrow and a forward arrow. If you share uh -huh. again, it's fit to the very bottom left of your screen. You should be able to afford, go forward. Okay, let's see. Sorry about that, everybody. I'm not the best on technology. Let's see. So the... If you... Go down to the very bottom left. It should come up when you hover. Did you see it? Oh, there you forward it. That goes? Okay, thank you. There you go. Okay, so um, sorry for that delay. So defining the direct care workforce. We uh, broke it down into four categories that you're probably familiar with. And the first is the certified homemaker or home health aides. And these are people who are usually through an agency, um, either pay privately, through Medicaid, sometimes Medicare, that are trained, certified, and can help with a range of um, health issues, meeting the activities of daily living, companion care, um, a, a range of services that can help someone maintain their independence and be safe in their home. The next is the certified nursing aide who usually works in an inpatient setting. It could be a um, long-term care facility, adult daycare center, um, hospitals. There's a, a range of settings for them, but they usually are inpatient with a larger staff, they have more training requirements. Um, and there was a severe shortage of them under COVID because of the, the stress and the danger of working in an inpatient facility in COVID. So we saw a lot of people leave during COVID. The state did offer a higher hourly wage for a, a limited time under COVID to encourage people to stay. But once again, we didn't see that people come back in the same numbers. So not only was there a shortage, you know, in 2018, 2019, it went down under COVID and it has not come back yet. The direct support professionals, I think that you are probably more familiar with that provide, again, a range of individualized care for people with disabilities, um, which is very direct focused on that individual's needs. And then the self-directed employee, which is very similar. So these four areas is what we were, we were looking at. And we looked at the growth of the direct care workforce in New Jersey. So, um, you know, it was starting to, to get up and looked like it was growing in 2016, 2017, 18, except the need was growing even faster. Um, and when we look ahead to 2030, where we're going to have a tipping point in New Jersey, where there are gonna be more people over 65 than we have students in our classroom. And I'm not saying that everybody who's older is going to need help, but we know there's going to be an increase in need. Not only do we are the baby boomers retiring, do we have more people over 65? They're living longer as well. So at some point in their life, the chances go up that they're going to need some assistance at home. So we did see some growth before COVID, but we still we keep seeing the need increase even faster than, than that job growth. 
So we convened uh, a, a group together a little more than two years ago of over 175 people to learn about the needs and the issues surrounding the workforce. And that what we heard over and over from everybody we've talked to is shortages, shortages, shortages. Every setting, every place, every county in New Jersey. And with that, we mobilized and we broke out into three different committees. So we have uh, we had an advisory council overseeing us. We have the workforce committee, which has about 25 representatives from providers throughout New Jersey, um, administrators in the Department of Human Services and the Division of Aging Services, the Department of Disabilities, um, frontline workers, academics. We've had a great coalition going through what are the issues and the challenges that are facing the workforce today. We have a state policy committee that is now bringing everything that we talked about and we learned and the priorities, bringing that forward to our state legislators to try to make improvement. And what I forgot here is we also have the data committee, um, which has recently conducted a survey of all uh, home health aides in the state, but also a few thousand CNAs to learn more about their needs, their challenges, um, how long they've been in the field and how long they plan to stay in the field. So getting that data on who is out there, who holds the license, who's available to work is going to be very, very important for us going forward. So when we discussed for about 18 months shaping our priorities, um, one of the great things was we found that it was easy to build consensus because often we end up competing for a resource and competing against each other, right? So if there's one healthcare provider that is, you know, is looking for more for more workers has a shortage, maybe they offer higher pay. So that there are a lot of things we can do to recruit people, but we're really just moving the same people around, not bringing more people into the field. So we decided we're gonna to work together to help, you know, the rising tide lifts all ships so that we all benefit from this instead of just shifting workers around. We also found out from talking to some of our provider members that there's actually a shortage in trainers, which makes it even more difficult. Several times people have uh, recruited or, or offered free training for a class of CNAs or home healthcare workers, and then they can't find the schools or the trainers to do it. So not only the shortage in workers, shortage in the trainers themselves. And the way around that is a lot of the providers, they start doing their own training. Um, they have employees that have been with them a long time that want to move into patient care. They can bring people in from the outside, but they have started to take it on themselves. And they're actually getting really good results because they're familiar with the employees. The employees already like working for them. They know the patients. So they are seeing some success for that. But we know not everybody can do that because that is really a big, that's a big ask. And some of the barriers that we're seeing in training and recruiting people is one, just language. New Jersey is the most diverse state in the country and we have the most uh, most number of languages spoken here. A lot of, is not just the direct care worker test, but these tests are held in English and sometimes Spanish if you know to ask for it. And that's about it. One of the things we've been pushing for and the Department of Human Services is working on now is to translate these tests into the languages that people seeking the job speak. We heard over and over from our coalition members that they have great people who can do this work, who um, are, are great, have the skills, they're great at their job, but they can't pass the written test because they didn't go to school in this country. Their English is fine. There are other tools they can use if they have to translate something from English, but the test itself, if you didn't go to school in this country, you might not be able to pass that written test. So that is something that we're making progress on. The other thing is transportation. Because there are people who live in remote areas. Not everybody has public transportation in New Jersey. So that was a real problem. And then the difference in our geography around the state. Um, you know, Bergen County has over a million people in it. And like Salem and Gloucester have 100,000. So there's such a range in our geography, which has different needs. So we realize one size isn't going to fit all. It's not going to be the same solution for everybody. And then the real, the, the current barrier, one of the biggest ones is you can get paid more working in Target or Wawa than for these harder jobs where you need skills, you need training, you need to be certified. You're working with people. It's rewarding, but it can be challenging. You can get an easier job and, and paid more by doing retail or working in a big box store. So that's where the real competition is. Okay, now I'm struggling with the uh, screen share. Let's see, there we go. 
So again, one of the things that we decided early on is we're going to build consensus and not compete with each other. So the, the resource that we're competing for is people. And then we had agreement on who we're talking about, these four categories. And we also talked a lot about when we make change, it has to be a holistic approach because doing one piece won't do it. If you, for example, if you raise the wage in one setting, same people will go to that setting. If you fix one thing that doesn't bring in more people, it doesn't recruit more, it doesn't retain them. So it has to be a, a wide approach thinking of from the day someone says, you know, I'm interested in pursuing this. I want to work with people. I want to be an aide through their training, their career, and how do you retain them and keep them in that field longer? And again, we just, we want to increase the number of workers and not just shuffle them around. So the priorities that we're working on now are to increase access to training for the entire direct care workforce, and also increasing the pipeline of new workers. If you have seen ads around recently, um, the state Department of Human Services has put up a, a campaign called uh, Jobs That Care in New Jersey. And on it, it has information for people interested in working with disabled people, has information on home health aides, and they're starting to advertise that around the city. I've seen it a few times on turnpike uh, billboards. I've heard it on the radio. So we're really glad that they move forward with that. They're doing a great job, but people have to know about these jobs. We have to reach out and find people who aren't doing it now. We've got to find you know new blood to go into this. So there's a, a multi-pronged approach to increasing the pipeline. And then something which sounds so small, but is such a challenge, is putting the credentialing and licensing all under one state agency. Right now, they're in two different areas. Those departments don't really talk to each other, and it makes it harder for people to get their license, maintain it, and also to, to switch back and forth between the jobs. One of the things that we realized in, um, in training is that the first, like, several, many hours of a home care worker also apply to a CNA. So you're already on your way, on the path to getting that license instead. If we had them centered under one agency, it'd be easier for people to do a few more classes, do a little bit more and hold two licenses. So um, as I mentioned before, the state website that is up now, uh, Jobs That Care New Jersey, has training requirements. It has where we can find the training. It has the contact information, and it also has, um, they're working on the job matching part, but it has a, a description of what these jobs are, even some videos, so people can see a realistic view. This is what it's like to work in this field. This is what it's like to work with people. Um, as I said, we're really working on the language access to those exams, and the Department of Human Services is moving on that, and we're streamlining the process for becoming a trainer. Um, there's legislation out there that will make it easier for reasons no one was sure of. New Jersey had requirements above and beyond the federal requirements for being a trainer. We ask that that be lowered so that more nurses or former aides can actually be the trainers themselves. And then we want to establish these portable stackable credentials. And we're actually having a meeting on that today. So like I said, if you've done one, that training really applies to another. And one of the things that we're currently fighting for is if people have worked as a direct service professional and they've worked for the disability community or self-directed, you have the skills to do this. You shouldn't have to go through all of that training because you've been doing the job. You might not have had the same classroom training that a CNA or a CHHA did, but we know you can do the job. So let's make it easier for people to take a few more steps or a few more classes and get those other credentials. Okay, so that is the um, the synopsis of what we're doing with the Essential Jobs Essential Care Coalition. We are we have been focused mostly on those CNAs and CHAs, but we've had a great representation from the DSP community. And one of the things that we really hope is that when people are done as a caregiver, if they want to move on as a caregiver or aid from one area they will pursue working with another. Again, we said, we know we have the skills, but you know they have the temperament, the people skills, and we wanna make it easier for people to move from one to the other. We also want them to feel appreciated. We want them to be rewarded financially, and we wanna see this field grow over the next couple of years. So that was my information in a nutshell. Um, would Does anybody have any 
questions? I know I went through it really quickly. Uh, well, there was one question, uh, I believe, uh, Kathy. Um, someone wanted to know, how can we get higher wages for our workers, especially uh, DSPs? Yeah, well, it's interesting. So because all of the disability services are under the umbrella of Department of Human Services, it's actually easier to um, get higher wages there. And I think that the disability community is highly motivated and highly organized. I think it has to constantly be requested that it keeps up, not only increase the wage to make it more fair and more livable, but keep up with the cost of living. So again, under COVID, there were like, you know, like slap ons, like we'll give you a dollar more an hour or $3 more if you do this. That has to be consistent and always asking for more until it's clear that wages are tied to the cost of living increases um, and, and quickly tied to them. So you're not waiting a year or two to have a raise. What's harder with the CNAs and the home care workers is they are overseen by multiple agencies and it's more difficult to get raised wage increases for them. So that's one of the reasons we wanna simplify and get people under one roof. So then when we talk about raising wages for all of them, it's, you know, people aren't just gonna say, oh, I'm just gonna go to this setting instead. And, you know, we want them paid more, but if people are just going back and forth for whoever decides to increase their wage that year, we're not gonna get ahead and we're not gonna solve this problem. But I think it's consistently asking and do not give up. True. I don't believe there are any more questions as of yet. Okay. Well, I have to actually go to the direct care workforce meeting. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I will send you the slides and my emails on that. We're happy to have anybody join our coalition. We welcome all perspectives in, in resolving this crisis. And we really hope that uh, we see more significant improvement over the next over the next legislative cycle. That's what we're really pushing for now. Thank right. you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, expanding the direct care workforce is really near and dear to my heart, especially for the future of self-direction. I really appreciate the effort that's already in involved in what you guys are doing. Thank um, you. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, please remember to join our next session. It's a support coordinator panel. It's talking about the role of the support coordinator in the self-direction process. So we'll see you there. Thank you so much.